that patients with muscle conditions need as much that as anyone else. So what we recommend is aerobic exercise, aerobic meaning that is low intensity exercise that you can do while breathing fully and comfortable and that you can keep over time. And we recommend that with respecting the patient's limits. That, that is, if it's uh, driving muscle pain, if it's leading to exhaustion, if the next day you cannot do anything, then you're doing too much. You have to go back and down. Uh, for instance, we recommend uh, even a static bike, and we typically recommend to start with one to two minutes without no resistance, and then build it up very slowly. It can be one minute per week, it can be one minute per month, it really depends on the patient. Uh, but the general idea is that you need to keep your muscles working uh, within the limits that you find are good for yourself. Thank you. I'll just add a couple other things to that. Um, I think water therapy uh, is probably the best type of exercise you can get if you have access to a pool. Uh, and it's great if you have a, a trainer or a physical therapist or if you just have somebody in the pool with you, uh, I think that would be helpful. But uh, as you probably know, when you're in the water, you just have more flexibility, you have, you're have you just lighter. There's The gravity issue isn't so, um, so extreme. Uh, and then the other issue is just to maintain the muscle bulk that you have. And, and that's why I think a lot of people uh, get weaker is because they just don't maintain what they have. Uh, I think it would be good to have a physical therapy session at some point so that you can learn the, pro the proper exercises and then you can continue to do those on your own and on your own at home as home exercises and a lot of people I know, I know it's really hard to continue with the routine but it's so important to maintain the, the muscle strength that you have hi I um, so I have a question Right now, basically, um, Chloe has, is having physical therapy, but most of it is um, stretching. So the physical therapist does a lot of stretching, and she tries to align her to make sure that she's aligned properly when she walks. Um, so she stretches her calves, her, you know, just the legs and everything like that. But we don't really have that many exercises that she's giving her. So I don't know if that is enough, just the stretching. Is, is that just enough, or should we do you said something else. I just don't know what specific exercises that we should do. Is there anything that um, you can recommend specifically? Well, any, you know, at this age, normal life includes exercise. So walking, playing, going to the pool, that is exercise. What is more important to have done by the physiotherapist is what you cannot do by yourself. So stretching and in particular, uh, spine if there has not been spinal fusion trying to help the spine to be aligned to be able to curve in as much as possible preventing contractures all that is important if uh, some aerobic exercise can be added if the physiotherapist has a pool and a warm pool then that's fine but otherwise um, normal life includes exercise can you bike if you can bike that's fine uh, so it's just you will get to know your own limits. You will be the best person to know what is too much for you. So when you get there, you have to learn what to stop. It's not a problem you have to stop. It's not a problem you have if you have to rest. But if you're comfortable with doing anything that you feel like doing, then go for it. And I'll just add, you know, for all ages, you have to find something you really enjoy. Otherwise, you're not going to continue with it. And I think, you know, we as adults, uh, if we start an exercise program, if it's not convenient, if it's not uh, something we enjoy, we'll probably stop. So, you know, there's so many different exercise programs that are, quote, fun. There's something called Zumba, which is dancing, aerobic exercise to Latin music. There's all different kinds of dance classes. And I think it would be something to, to look at for her. But again, she doesn't have to do the whole class the first time. As Dr. Ferrero said, just a couple of minutes, and then build your way up. You know, just pace yourself. But again, it's so important to find something you enjoy. Or, you know, I can't think of um, all the other activities that some of the kids do. 
I was thinking that Andre's, uh, they, they do a lot of uh, physical, do they do judo and karate? Um, they tried martial arts, but um, uh, we... um, I'm sure most of you know we used to be acrobats, their dad and I. So we have um, uh, like trapeze in the house and um, swings and all sorts of interesting things and trampoline, they love trampoline. Although uh, sometimes it's a little dangerous, but um, <laughs> they uh, we do yoga too at home. Um, we do all sorts of crazy things. We do cough assists over balls, <laughs> um, big medicine balls, just to try different uh, positions as the air is going in. Um, we do. Uh, they love sports, so they play in the backyard and do all sorts of kinds of sports. And the boys uh, wrestle all the time with each other. So. It's nice that they have the same disability. Yeah. <laughs> Sophie, I'm going to speak for you again. Um, when Sophie was little, she really enjoyed um, adaptive swim lessons and adaptive horseback riding, which, you know, so those are a couple of out of the way things, but those were fun for you. I think yoga is an excellent idea because it gives you aerobic exercise plus stretching plus breathing exercises plus self-centric. Yeah, we do so a lot of spinal, uh, try and work out, I try and work a lot on spinal rotation and a lot of uh, uh, strength on uh, it. Uh, I do a lot of spinal rotation with them, uh, some, some where I assist and some where they use their own body weight with it. And I do a lot of um, sideline stuff. So uh, sometimes they'll, uh, if, if they're uh, you know feeling good, they'll go in sort of a side plank. But sometimes like they'll have to modify with their right leg down, um, just to build up the lateral sides of both of their bodies. Right now their spines are straight, so my whole thought process was once I start a curve, then I'll try and work on the opposite side of the curve to do the best that we can do. It's probably you know obviously inevitable that they will curve, but. Um, so right now it's more of a preventative, but also teaching them the proper techniques so that when they do actually curve, they already know what we're doing. And um, uh, what else do we do? Uh, a lot of, just a lot of, uh, you know, spine stuff. So. Owen is hip hop too. Oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> Owen is the hip hop master. <laughs> He'll tell you all the time. <laughs> Our boys started Taekwondo about two years ago, and that's been great because it's so much stretching, um, but it also has helped their balance and control. Um, <clears throat> also, it's um, an individualist sport. Team sports, obviously, we all know, don't go well. And so it, it has been a confidence builder for them, too. So um, that's been a good experience for us. One other thing we do also is indoor rock climbing which um, is a lot of reaching up high. And it gives them, um, I put them on the, I, I will let them, so I give them a little bit of incentive and help to get up to the top. So psychologically, it's really good for them because they think they're, they are accomplishing a lot, but they kind of think they're doing it all on their own. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice reaching and, and reaching up on both sides. So I think that lengthening is really important. Some of our patients also enjoy uh, ping pong, you know, because it doesn't require a lot of endurance, but it's still good exercise and they can be very good at that, and that's about building confidence too. And uh, some, but one of the older ones have enjoyed Tai Chi, because that's a lot about endurance, but not very straining. It's not very, it's not a lot of fun for young kids, but for those who are older, they, they find it useful. My boys also like to swim, the older one. Uh, would you, uh, in terms of a golf assist, would you recommend doing uh, preventive use of the golf assist machine uh, to get rid of the mucus or only when um, there is an infection or the Okay, I don't think there's any. Uh, peer-reviewed studies on cough assist with step and wine. There is a poster here today, or this weekend, on uh, using the cough assist for collagen 6. And they found that in patients uh, with collagen cyst, if 6, it really improved their, their lung capacity if they did it twice a day. 
So again, it's a different condition, but they also have diaphragm weakness. So I do tell my 7-1, uh, at least adult patients, if they can't do it twice a day, and most of them say, I really don't need it. But when they're sick, they use it, and they, it really helps them when they're ill, um, and you can use it as often as you want when you're ill, hourly, to help you bring up the mucus. But I think that um, Ann Rutkowski is the one who kind of instilled in my brain that the caucasus is like exercise for the lungs, and it keeps the balloons nice and you know stretchy rather than getting really hard and stiff. So I would recommend, if you can, twice a day. I don't know what you're yeah, I agree with that. Uh, and, and also in my experience, most patients will not use it. There are some exceptions. There are some patients, because generally speaking, for the reduced respiratory capacity that we see in the one, it's quite surprising that there are not that many lung infections, actually. Uh, so I, just, I was going to mention, we do um, 20 breaths in the morning and 20 breaths at night only on method and um, it, uh, oh. we do 20 breaths in the morning and 20 breaths in the night on the inspiratory method and uh, we, we have never had a pneumonia and um, but partially maybe we live in the desert it's dry but um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's I find it actually very very helpful for the boys and their PFTs have been very very stable ever since we started BiPAP and and the caucus this week we've actually improved our PFTs does anyone here not know what a cough assist is? Just make sure. Okay. And also. Oh, sure. Well, before I answer that, I just want to mention that there are not good data to support using the cough assist, but uh, I still think there's a tremendous amount of clinical evidence, both for airway clearance and then the uh, whole idea of using it routinely when you're not sick, I think. Uh, data isn't there yet. I think um, there are some old studies that uh, sort of in total suggest that it could be very helpful. Um, and I think of it both in terms of re-expanding uh, the lungs when they become hyalectatic, like what we all do when we wake up in the morning and we take a deep breath and stretch. That makes the lungs more compliant, easier to move. And then the other thing is that it, think of it as physical therapy for the rib cage. Um, I know that does a whole lot for the spine, but certainly moving the ribs where they articulate with the spine, all of those joints, the 12 joints of the ribs, can become stiff if you don't breathe deeply. Uh, keeps the intercostal muscles moving some, and I think altogether that can be helpful in uh, maintaining chest wall mobility, at least delaying the decrease in chest wall mobility. And so um, the question then is how often to do it, and when we set out to try and figure this out, we talked to a physical therapist, and you guys obviously are quite familiar with range of motion exercises. The typical approach is you uh, expand or you um, extend the joint as far as you can and hold it for about 30 or 40 seconds. It doesn't work very well with your respiratory system. Holding a breath for 30 or 40 seconds is not really acceptable, and so the idea was to, uh, to substitute the frequency uh, of range of motion. And so and we had settled on doing 15 minutes of therapy of about 10, 10 breaths in a time. Um, if you add that up, it comes up to 150 breaths. Um, yeah, 10 breaths per minute for 15 minutes. Um, there's nothing magical about that number. It's probably a bit excessive. And what I've usually done is suggested doing about a 10 minute treatment with 10 breaths per minute with you know, a uh, break of whatever, you know, 20 or 30 seconds in between those, uh, those, those 10 breaths. The question then of frequency of the airway clearance treatments is also um, uh, an interesting one in that, you know, when we that don't have neuromuscular disease get sick and cough, we cough until we clear whatever mucus we have. And, you know, if you're trying to make an order like that for a nurse, it's very difficult, but as a parent, you can kind of read your child and decide when it is that they mobilize the mucus that they have, or when they're looking better, and you can continue on until that point. And can you just explain what the yeah. machine looks like and what they do? So what the machine looks like, it looks like if you were to get a pair of high tops and turn the box on its side, it would be about that size. Um, it has a 
screen on it and you program in three things. You program in an inspiratory pressure, um, and then a pause time, and then an expiratory pressure. Um, and what you do is you um, can put the mask on or use a mouthpiece and then uh, turn the machine on. It can either go automatically or you can do it manually where you can look at your child and say, okay, here we go, and do the breath in and then shift to uh, uh, the negative pressure to pull the breath out. Um, and, or you can, they have a sort of a triggering mechanism where you can actually just put the mask on um, and then when your child breathes, uh, the breath, I'm sorry, the additional uh, inspiratory systems will go in and then when they start to breathe out, the suction to help pull the air out um, can be engaged. Um, uh, there are ways of programming it to have a, a high pressure if you really want to get a good insufflation or a lower pressure <coughs> if you want a lower pressure for some reason. You can program it to do both the breathing in and the breathing out um, or as I mentioned just uh, doing the, the breathing in portion. Um, it's widely used here in the States. I think it's really the core of all uh, assisted airway clearance. Um, uh, in France in particular, uh, Suzanne McKenna Roy, who's a neurologist who's here, has done a lot of work using something called the Alpha 200, which is just the breathing in part of the coccyxis. Um, but here we're fairly well um, uh, supportive of using the coccyxis because I really think the exhalation part adds a tremendous amount to airway clearance. Um, I just wanted to say, as an adult, um, when I looked into getting a competence so that I could exercise my lungs, it's um, basically unaffordable, even if you have insurance. And you're already paying, you know, I'm paying $400 a month for my training here, and to get a competence would be another 400 So, you know, that's why I was really pursued it. Um, and also, just so you know, if you want to see a Conferences. Um, the home care company that I use, Home Care, they here in the um, area of the food, and they have one there if you want to take a look. I'd also say if, if you have smaller children, I I, I have to uh, cue my youngest. Originally, I would you have to watch the, the thing on the screen and say breathe in, breathe out, because if they go against it, it doesn't. It is very helpful if you have a child that you can communicate effectively with. Um, it makes it a lot easier. And so that means having a child out of infancy, um, obviously a child that has you know, good cognitive uh, potential. I was just going to say um, that to Daniela that some states and some regions have um, equipment exchanges, and I see Caucasus on our local one. Um, a, lot, a lot of times they're giving them away. So it's in Vermont. Um, so it's for the Vermont, New Hampshire, um, Northern New York region that there's a, an equipment exchange. But if you dig around, you might find one in your region and find some used and often hardly used equipment. Any other questions? That's just what I've chosen to do. And a regular therapeutic treatment, we usually think of five sets of five breaths of breathing in, breathing out five times, take a break, cough, suction, and then continue on for another set of five breaths. But for doing, um, I'm sorry, for a total of 25, but for the raised volume therapy, if you, you know, if 10 times 10, that's about 100. And what I'll then do when the parents shake their heads and say, you're kidding me, is say, do the best that you can. Yeah. Yeah. There's, obviously, there's a reality to all of this that we sometimes don't really grasp very much in an office visit. Yes? Um, uh, I understand oh. the question. Oh. Um, um, are you done? Okay. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Please. Um, I just had a question about, I noticed that I don't tolerate really cold or really hot um, weather very well, and I'm just wondering if there's any 
correlation between like core muscle function and um, core like heat regulation. I would just say I think that's really common. I've been informally surveying people here, and many of the sub one families are saying the same thing, and it was something I brought up in May during the sub one scientific meeting, that there's a number of people that seem to be intolerant to extreme hot or extreme cold. I know for my daughter, Sophie, tell me if you're the same. She gets too hot, and it's automatic. I'm done. I can't do it. I feel like I'm going to throw up. Um, just stops functioning. Um, when it's cold, and I probably heard more hot from more of you, but for my daughter, when it's cold, she gets too cold. It's I hurt. I want to sit. My legs hurt. Um, granted, we live in Iowa, so it does get cold in Iowa. <laughs> um, but uh, like outdoor swimming is hard for her unless it's like 100 degrees with 100% humidity because she gets too cold in that water. So for swimming for my daughter, it's indoor, and then we're good to go. But it, it, it's common that these guys are having extreme team yeah, I issues. Like, I feel like in the cold, it sometimes feels like it's hard to move. But in the heat, it also kind of feels like it's hard to move, but feel like different. It feels different. Like it's really, I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. This, it's an interesting point that uh, you raised in the last conference. And, uh, I mean, think about it, that, that we are exploring some bioenergetics abnormalities, some abnormalities in the way the muscle triggers energy production by the, by the energy power, power in the houses of the home. So we're trying to understand that better, but this is not uncommon in other muscle conditions we see in representations. Off the top of my head, because there's, again, we haven't looked at into this in detail with a proper study. But one factor is that most of you do not have body tissue at all. Uh, and this plays a role in regulated temperature. And another factor is that with the respiratory situation that many of you have, it's what we can call the atal tone, so the, the involuntary muscle, uh, nervous system that controls reaction to heat or to cold might not be functioning, the, the window of regulation might be tighter than, than usual. Um, the other patients with a similar situation complain of the same, so it seems to be rather a secondary consequence of the situation than something very specific. The other thing we noticed with her is um, she's really hot, and she gets is indoors and the rest of us all need to cover up, she doesn't need to. So she doesn't tolerate the cold, but yet in the cold she can stay warm-ish. Did you agree? Yeah. Yeah, we were just talking about that. My voice will never put warm clothes on. It'll be freaking outside. I'm fine. Uh, will your non-affected children put clothes on when you're cold? Yeah. 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 But the one, but the voice is impossible. <laughs> if I can get anything warm on them, and it's and yeah. my youngest, we live in North Dakota, so it's really cold out. And in the winter, some days in the or in the spring when it's starting to get just a little. In the spring when it's, you know, 50 degrees out, he'll want to go outside in shorts and a muscle shirt because he's just like, I'm hot. This is great. He thinks <laughs> he doesn't think anything of it. And the rest of us like, put a sweatshirt on. Like it's cold. I have to force him to put a sweatshirt on quite often. I will just add. Um, Besides the fact that this could be part of people with muscle disease, if this really is an issue, you should bring it up at your doctor visit because heat or cold intolerance could be part of a medical condition such as a thyroid abnormality. So you might want to have the kids' thyroid checked at some point. Um, but but then non-alarmed. 
they, they get alarmed and they powwow and then they say, but we're not harmed, it's okay. And uh, so that's one of the reasons I'm here and you know, I'm, now I'm wondering if it's spine or um, what, what are your feelings about that? I, I don't know exactly which numbers to tell you. I was going to bring papers to show you, but I was on vacation and didn't have them accessible to me. So I, I think it, what number it is probably doesn't matter a whole lot because they all kind of go down in parallel at, at, a, at a certain rate. Um, but certainly, if you're beginning to get a curve, it's putting you where you're bending over or you're hyperflexing, it's going to put the muscles of breathing in an unfavorable position. Um, and that's going to cause difficulties and it can accelerate loss of lung capacity or lung function. Um, I guess the simplest question would be if the orthopedic surgeon is considering the possibility of doing uh, a you know, spinal intervention. If your son is your son is five foot ten. He's thirteen, yeah. and his curve is really high, and it's a twist. Yeah. So it's up by the shoulder blade. Sure. So the last time he had the X-ray, it was only twenty six degrees, mm -hmm. but then he suddenly shot up two or three inches yep. since the last x-ray, which was in maybe um, October. So he's grown, so I'm thinking since then we can see the Probably got worse. Yeah. Um, and he's had the PFT since the last x-ray. Sure. Um, so uh, as far as the spine, I mean, if it's progressing and it's becoming disfigured, I mean, certainly if it's becoming uncomfortable, then uh, repair would probably make some sense. The question would then be, what type of repair? Um, and if he's five foot ten, and he's supposed to be six foot five because his dad is super tall or something like that, then maybe you wait a little bit longer. Um, there are gross bearing um, uh, devices that can be put in that Dr. Roy mentioned some yesterday, and those are also possible. But if he's, you know, thirteen, then a surgeon may opt to uh, say, well, five foot ten is a good height, let's stick with this and use his spine. Um, the one thing that um, does not typically happen after spine fusion or spinal surgery in neuromuscular disease is that you don't typically regain lung function. And so intervening earlier with something that can support growth, I think, is uh, becoming much more the, uh, the standard practice in orthopedics. So the odds are it is the spine that is affecting the PFTs? Uh, well, it, uh, among, you know, obviously the you know, underlying condition is set by one, but it can certainly, it's like an added burden on the breathing. On Even the if it's so high? Yeah, if you're in the middle of the thorax and have a curve, that's actually a bad place to have a curve. Breathing, it can sort of collapse or limit the, the length of the thorax and therefore limit the space available for the lungs to expand. Um, so, yeah, and it's, if you want to limit the impact on lung volume or lung capacity, the lower the curve, the better. So if you're up in the thorax, from sort of within the rib cage, that's a position where it's going to have more impact, sort of a compressive impact on the, on the rest of the lungs. It almost seems like it's up near his neck, you know, up near his sure. neck. Well, just to, you know, that's shortening the potential length of his spine, that's going to, you know, have a, an impact on, on his lung capacity. So, I, I think also the, the issue of, of, of comfort um, and how he's doing, quality of life, um, I think is, uh, is even more important. One of his symptoms, I don't know if you all find that this with your kids, is he has almost he has very high pain tolerance. So he never, ever, if he, if something hurts, we go to the emergency room. Yeah. I mean, if he has, a, if he says his ear hurts, it's always a major ear, like he says, <coughs> my ear hurts, he has a major ear infection, like blisters on the eardrum and things that the pediatrician says, this calls for codeine, and he just says, it just feels a little itchy or something. He does. He has clinically high pain tolerance. Uh, just 
very bizarre. He can feel pain, but it's not normal sensation of pain. So nothing is bothering him. He doesn't get headaches. He doesn't. So we never know about how his sleep was last night. He's never had a headache. He's never had, except when he had a concussion. You know, it's like my head hurts right here. You know, that's an emergency room visit. You know, so does anyone else? Has anyone else noticed that? Prods and everything happening her whole life, and this is normal to her. So, is her high pain tolerance truly just that, or is it she's desensitized to certain things because she's been dealing with it her whole life? Or is it both? Yeah. This is way beyond that. Yeah. <laughs> this is bizarrely <laughs> high pain tolerance. Sometimes some kids avoid going again to the doctors, or sometimes they fail to communicate the pain. They minimize pain unconsciously. It's not that they are lying, but they just don't feel like going to the doctor again. So I just like to bring up going to the doctor. A lot of us don't like going to the doctor. I'm probably guilty of that as well. Uh, but I think it's really important uh, to make sure that you do have regular visits, especially in regard to the pulmonary status, which I, I think you're all aware of. And I think when you go to the doctor visit, Hopefully you're dealing with a team, a multidisciplinary team who uh, understands your condition. But I would suggest bringing a list of questions because I know personally when I'm a patient, the doctor gets called out or rushed out. I go home and think, oh, I forgot to ask such and such. So I really think it's helpful to write down your questions. I think it's helpful to bring all your medications so they know what you're taking, not just the red pill or whatever. And, and I think it's also important to bring the names of your physicians with you or your physical therapist or whoever you're seeing so they can send them a copy of the report and what your plan is. Uh, and, and, you know, if you are, I'm the neurologist, so I make recommendations to the pulmonary doctor. He needs a sleep study. We need to see, you know, what his, if his BiPAP needs have changed over the past few years. So I think it's really important when you go to the visit, you go prepared. Uh, with your meds, with the names of your providers, and preferably with somebody else, because sometimes it's a lot of information, and it's nice to have another family member or friend there that can just help you afterwards to discuss what happened. And if you want, oh, and one other thing. Uh, one of my patients showed me a bracelet that he wears. It looks like a Lance Armstrong type, um, you know, live strong bracelet, but it's actually a medical alert bracelet. And inside of it, there's a little like barcode that has all his medical information. And he got it at CVS. If you all know CVS is, you know, a drugstore here in, in uh, the United States. And he said it was under ten dollars. Uh, I think it was called MyInfo.com. I, I have a picture on my phone. But I think it's so important to have some type of medical alert, either a bracelet, a necklace, or a card in your wallet stating your condition, because the, I think one of the worst things that could happen to you, and Dr. Dr. Hank will tell you, is you go into the emergency room, you might be short of breath, you might have some respiratory symptoms, and they put oxygen on you, which is probably not a good thing. Um, I want to just tell you about one of my patients who was a really intelligent man. He's now 29, but at 25, he had a respiratory crisis. He had been coming to the clinic fairly regularly as a kid. His mom uh, would always bring him. And then once he became an adult, he really didn't think he needed to come back on a regular basis. And I'm probably preaching to the choir here because you're very you know, devoted uh, parents and, and patients and you're here. But he didn't think he needed to come back. He was working as a banker. And he'd get colds here and there, but he was OK. Well, at 25, he started getting more colds. And one morning, he woke up, and he was so confused that he couldn't even find his clothes uh, I don't know who was with him, but they realized something's very wrong. And they brought him to the hospital, and they gave him oxygen, and he went into respiratory arrest. Uh, had, had pneumonia, but finally got his BiPAP because he had been having a lot of hypoventilation and retaining that carbon dioxide during the night, which can happen um, in, in this condition. And, and now he's very, um, 
it uses his BiPAP, he feels so much better in the morning. But unfortunately, if you are lost to follow up, especially I think between 18 and 25 is a common time when patients feel like, you know, I'm doing okay, I really don't need to go to those long visits anymore. So uh, I just want to give you that information so when your kids do become young adults um, that you want them to just have, you know, regular care and just try to be responsible uh, about seeing their doctor even if it's something they don't want to do on a regular basis. As you you know, as a parent, um, you can still nag your kids when they become adults. I've learned that. <laughs> Uh, I just want to go back to the kind of the, the vital cough and the breathing exercises discussion because we have a little three-year-old uh, and he's still kind of learning his body and how to control a lot of his functions and one of the things he can't really do well is hold his breath and you briefly mentioned there's not a lot of value in doing large lung expansion and holding your breath uh, or is there? Is there any, any things we should be doing for those kinds of exercises as well? well if you can have him take deep breaths and hold, I mean I think that has some potential but yeah, the, the image that I had in my talk yesterday was of breath stacking. Um, that requires glottic or sort of throat control. Um, that's a perfectly legitimate way of doing deep breathing. You don't need to use a cough assist or sure. the alcohol. Any tips on how to teach that, using that mechanism if he's not familiar with it? I mean, he's three, so maybe yeah. there's an age thing, but. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, any good guidance to give you. Uh, just practice. I would recommend a speech pathologist and somebody who specializes in voice um, that can be really helpful for breathing exercises and training. Since the oxygen was brought up earlier, I just want to um, give my own comments on that. I fully agree if your children end up in the emergency room acutely ill, oxygen should only be given if they're already you know, on ventilation. Um, and the reason that is, is that you have two drives, no, three drives to breathe. One is acid. Uh, if you have high carbon dioxide, your blood becomes a little bit acidic, so the pH declines. Uh, CO2, obviously, and then oxygen. Uh, if you're chronically hypercarbic, the pH remains a little low, and the carbon dioxide remains high, the pH gets normalized by the kidneys and then you get that you accommodate to the high carbon dioxide and then your only drive to breathe is oxygen. So if you have low oxygen because your carbon dioxide is rising further and then you give oxygen, there's a theoretical risk of causing you to not breathe deeply. And then going into respiratory failure, like the situation that Carla just mentioned. Having said that, I don't want anybody to leave here with the thought that oxygen is bad. Um, it's very, very helpful, and that can be critical if you need it and everything else is being managed. And beyond that, the first thing that I think really needs to be considered if your child is hypoxemic and in the emergency room is the likelihood of pneumonia or something uh, related to um, uh, inadequate airway clearance or need for more airway clearance. And then related to that, one of the things that we sometimes see in the hospital is that your child's getting a cough assist treatment or physiotherapy, and they stop because of a desaturation. And I would actually argue that that's actually the wrong approach. You know, if you have mucus that's down in one part of the lung, what happens beyond that is that the blood flow is moved somewhere else where there's actually airflow. Okay, and if you take that mucus and mobilize it and then move it down to another part of the lung because it doesn't come out all the way, you can have an acute drop in oxygen. And somebody might look at that and say, whoa, we're going to stop. Um, we need to give a break. We'll give you some oxygen. But actually, the more appropriate approach would actually be to perhaps give a little break. You can give some oxygen, but then you need to continue on, because that's really a sign that you have mucus or secretions that haven't come out properly. Um, going back to speech pathology again, um, I think many of us with type 1 have an odd kind of mentality. Um, after my stand-up on Friday night, the guy who was playing American Sign Language said to me the next morning, do you have a cleft palate? And I was like, oh God, like, that's all I need to think about now. You know, and I'm not so confident enough. Um, 
And I know I'm here to have a funny voice. And I know my niece, you know, so very nasal. And through our Facebook page, it seemed there is some surgery that they maintain in the UK to actually remove some kind of threat or something to bypass this kind of nasal kind of tone that we seem to have. So I'm just curious, is it something common with everyone? The second one, why isn't it like this? I don't know, the only thing I would think that that might be is the uvula, which is a little thing that hangs down in the back. They might remove part of that uh, to perhaps increase uh, flow through the mouth or something like that. I don't really know. And high-pitched nasal voice is constant to a different degree, but it's present in most seven month patients. Um, I know of no one proposing this surgery, and none of the patients I know of have the problem, as I see it, is that the whole muscles of the uh, internal, you know, the whole internal muscles of the uh, nose and mouth are probably weak. So, is this surgery proposed to patients with muscle conditions or just to people who have no muscle problem and just have a nasal voice? Because the, the outcome might be very different. And I would be concerned as to the function of the outcome, you know, as in avoiding choking, as in avoiding, you know, the liquids that you drink to come out through your nose. I'm not sure there's enough experience with that kind of surgery in your situation. Um, I, was, I just noticed that most have that high-pitched palate, too. Is that High arch, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, that's that, that, that is common in any kind of uh, condition causing weakness of facial muscles because actually the palate expands when it's true with mastication with the action of the facial muscles. So any muscle condition that causes weak facial muscles from early in life will affect the shape of the palate. Yeah, we were looking into this kind of surgery with Chloe, and uh, actually our ENT is the one who sent us to uh, um, the Dr. Kunz that we see in uh, children, um, because he, he was an amazing ENT, and he said, well, she does have a little hole between a soft and a hard palate, and when she talks, the hole is supposed to close, but it doesn't, because probably because of the muscle weakness, he said, well, possibly we could do surgery, in the future, that was before she was diagnosed with it, um, 7 1. But now I feel like, after what you just said, probably I would not even put her through surgery anymore, but I'm just, you know, saying. If you have a very experienced surgeon who is willing to assess the situation carefully and who is confident on his technique, then I'm not telling you she shouldn't get surgery. Yeah. I'm just saying that, uh, to my knowledge, there is no experience with patients with this condition. So you should ask very carefully which are the chances of getting, you know, secondary functional problems. Uh, it also, I guess, depends on how much of a problem having a high-pitched nasal voice is. For you. Um, I wanted to add that I actually have uh, Daniela. You said it was called flap. I had, when I was five, I had a pharyngeal flap done. And um, before that surgery, I had a very nasal sounding voice. My parents and my family could hardly understand what I was saying. And um, so they did that surgery to correct it. And at that time, they said they didn't think I would ever be able to speak um, 100%. But they said that the surgery helped, um, and they removed, I don't know the medical terms, they removed um, the thing that hangs at the back of your throat. And they told me, as a child to prepare me, that it would be like they were putting in a, a trap door in my throat. Um, so when I started having carbon, uh, carbon dioxide buildup and had to know in about um, fixing that and having the trach. When they decided to do the trach, 
they thought that maybe um, the pharyngeal flap had somehow obstructed my airway and they had considered reversing it um, as to put it in a trach. They thought maybe that would somehow help, but they said that <coughs> my speech, I may go back to not being able to speak clearly. So in the end, they decided to do the trach. But what I always wondered is, if having that surgery um, leaded to me having the trach, if I hadn't had the surgery, um, and maybe some way else learned to speak clearly or had something else done, maybe I could have been on BiPAP too instead of having to be on a train with a ventilator. But that's just something that I always wondered about. It's always very difficult to know retrospectively. You know, I think it's a matter of weighing the, the advantages versus the risks. If you really have a serious communication problem, this is an important function. So if you have a good surgeon with experience and pregnancy operation with good <coughs> chances of getting a good functional result, then I think it makes sense considering and then deciding according to the risks. What I think is important is that you ask all the questions regarding to the functional consequences of the intervention. And, uh, and then if, if the communication issue, if the voice issue is not a functional problem, that maybe the prospect has a great change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have a question behind you? Behind you. Behind you. I just wanted to add, and it's quickly cycle back to the ER discussion. Um, with our daughter, we've done two things. She has a medical alert necklace that she wears that has her name, my contact information, her diagnosis, and then it says, be cautious with respiratory. And then second pull to that, our pulmonologist has given us a letter um, that we provide to the ER should she need to go, even if it's not for anything pulmonary. Um, so we keep a copy on our phone and pull it up. Like we were in the ER last summer for Lyme disease confirmed Lyme disease, um, and brought up the letter just in case. But secondly, there's a copy of it at her school, so that if she needs to get transported from school and we're not there, then the letter can at least go with her and the communication is there. Um, so if anyone wants a copy of the letter, I'm happy to share it. I have it right on my phone. Um, I feel like that hopefully is a catch, a catch all for um, an ER visit. And, uh, the letter lists off what to do and what not to do if you're the ER physician. So it's, yeah, if you're comfortable, yeah. It, yeah. Um, I'll put it on the Facebook group page. Um, so that if we're traveling, likely if we're at home, we're going to end up with someone on our pulmonologist's team attending to us. But in case we're not and we're traveling, then we have a copy of the letter on our phone. I think that's an excellent recommendation. And for some of our complicated patients, we recommend bringing x rays and we can provide general summary of uh, respiratory care. Um, the other thing that I think is helpful, it's sort of more of an intimidation thing for a you know, physician, is coming in with your equipment. And you have a cough assist, and they say, what on earth is that? So I'm going to keep my child alive, get out of the way. And, it. <laughs> and I think if you take that approach, I don't think anybody's going to get in your way. Um, and you'll get the result that you want. Um, but I just wanted to bring up the, the question of the trach, and obviously uh, I can't comment with any you know, specificity on your particular case, but um, you know, there, I think, are very few absolute indications for having a trach placed. One is you know, having problems breathing through your upper airway. That's pretty obvious. And uh, some people would argue that if you need ventilation beyond just at the night, during the night, you need a trach. I think there are plenty of patients here that you see going around with mouthpiece ventilation that demonstrates that that's completely false. Um, so um, I guess what I would sort of pose back to you is if the airway from the trach up is patent open, and obviously you're able to, to vocalize perfectly fine, um, I guess in sort of a, uh, a probing way, uh, rhetorically ask what the need for the trach is. Um, and, you know, I don't want to stir the pot too much, but you could certainly, if it's something that you would, uh, you know, appreciate not having, you know, may want to bring up that discussion. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we have plenty of patients that born prematurely that end up on ventilators initially, and then over the first few years they get weaned from support and the trick comes out and have a you know, little stoma that peels off. So it's not a permanent um, permanent solution. So. I can just go back to comment about the letter. Um, in France, there's the patient's organization who has um, designed and printed small uh, cards. But it's just paper cards, so it's very easy for the physician to fill in because you just have to tick the boxes and actually the items are more or less the same for most vascular diseases. So it includes the do and do not things about respiration, about anesthesia, about surgery, drugs, counterindicated. So it's very easy to fill in. Anyone, anyone can hide it in his wallet. And maybe this is something that you as a community can work on because you just have to fill in the diagnosis and then it says clearly what should not be done. Rachel actually locked the pulmonologist here in her room for about an hour and a half last <laughs> night and charged us with um, the task of coming up with some guidelines um, similar to what's been published in other conditions. And so we have a bunch of disorganized notes that will be put into order and um, we're hoping through the uh, by the end of the year to have a document that can be sort of a white paper that can be posted to the uh, Cure CMD website that won't be specific for any particular condition but we'll talk about principles sort of like what we talked about yesterday but with some you know special things like with you know set and one they need to be concerned about respiratory insufficiency sooner um, than in many other conditions and so hopefully it'll be of some use. Do you want to talk about flu shots? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, get a flu shot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Why not pneumonia shot? Well, it's <laughs> not a pneumonia shot. It's a shot for strep pneumonia, which is the most common bacteria for upper respiratory infections and bronchitis. So I don't want anybody to think like if you get the flu shot that you can't get the flu, but um, uh -huh. Yeah, it, it is still, you know, strep pneumonia still is a bacteria that causes, you know, the vast majority of ear infections, sinus disease. And so I personally, you know, feel very strongly about, you know, getting it. Um, so often. And is it every five years? Someone's told every five years? I, I heard there was a new vaccine out though for pneumonia. Is there? Where it's not every five years? I don't really know. I haven't been a general pediatrician yeah. for 15 years, so. So the recommendation for the pneumovax is only one time. Let's give her the mic. That's what I heard too. Yeah, there's a new one. Hi, I'm Mimi Lula. I'm a pulmonary pulmonologist at Stanford University. So um, the pneumovax, the PPV23, which was originally um, designed for the elderly. So people um, in 60 or 55 about I'm not an adult doctor. But it was a one time only for that population. It is also recommended for patients um, two and older with um, chronic lung diseases and other diseases. Um, but the recommendation technically by the CDC is a one time. Although people worry, when you talk to immunologists who actually look at um, the immune response to this vaccine, they know it wanes with time. And so for my patients, I will actually be checked and see if it's waned and I will be vaccinated. Oh, so it's not automatically every five years? I mean, that, no, that no. no. So the recommendation is once huh? from the um, Center for Disease Control. There's another vaccine that's newer, that's the, P, the uh, PCV13, that's for children um, five and younger, and that's a series. And that's, once you complete the series, you'll you get it. Um, so this is a completely unrelated question, but I was just curious about. Um, so I've noticed with my arms and fingers that I'm super flexible, um, and like they can move quite a lot. And I think talking on our Facebook group, um, I've heard a couple other people um, describe that as well. So I was just curious if there's why that is, um, if there's for sure um, a correlation to the stuff that with that. Um, as opposed to other parts of my body and muscles that may not be hyper flexible. Yeah, this is almost constant in young people. They don't admit that you're young. 
It usually changes with age. It can be functionally a problem because if you're trying to push a battle that is a bit hard and your finger is very flexible, you might not gather the strength you need to really push the battle. Uh, but it's something that we tend to see almost constantly. And after the age of 25, fingers tend they, they do they do not get really retracted, so it's not relevant they tend to be less flexible. We don't really know why. It's something that we see in other muscle conditions too. You know, many congenital muscle disorders have some degree of hyperlaxity in some joints, while other joints can be quite uh, contractile, can, can be quite quite rigid, which is the case for the for instance in hips or heels. And this is not something that is specific of seven one. We think in other you know, cases also it might be because in keeping the joint uh, aligned and stable, the muscles play a role. Uh, the muscles stabilize the joint. So because your muscles are smaller and less strong, the joint is more mobile, more flexible. Uh, so for a colonoscopy, um, without sedation, a lot of times the doctors will uh, and, and assist, insist on taking oxygen during the procedure. Is that not recommended or not recommended? I would say not. I would say not, and uh, presume you're on BiPAP at night. Yeah, I would recommend that if you get a colonoscopy that you're, you know, on your nasal ventilation, just like you're essentially, you know, even if it's well, if you're on sedate and you're perfectly awake, it may not matter, but if you're to do anything, I would definitely recommend your BiPAP as opposed to oxygen. I asked for no oxygen that they insisted on giving Well, if they want to feel that they're doing something to help your breathing, then they need to help your breathing. And, you know, not, and oxygen will make numbers look good, but if you really need something, you obviously need your ventilator. Did they put you on entitled CO2 during it? Yeah, they did. Yeah. 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 If they put them on oxygen, probably not, because the cannula would go in the nose. Maybe you So then in that case, we should always just bring a bypass to a procedure? Yeah. Yeah, I would be... Even like a dental procedure? Well, not a dental well, procedure. Well, it's a dental. <laughs> but if it's a dental procedure, it should be done somewhere where they can support breathing. And so not sort of at a, you know, a local you know, dentist's office where they would put some nitrous oxide on. And but is nitrous uh, contraindicated? Well, I think, I guess what going more with this is sedating. Right. Yeah, if there's any type of sedation, then breathing needs to be supported properly. Um, and it's probably not going to be done properly in a um, sort of an outpatient, you know, dental right. surgery. Right. Right. I have a question regarding um, BiPAP after um, spinal fusion. My daughter, you know, her, before spinal fusion, her oxygen, you know, PFT levels are very, very low, and she was extremely tired, and she was on BiPAP prior to surgery, for a few months prior, and after she had the surgery, which was just done in January, um, she felt like a new human being, you know, she could breathe better, she wakes up with no headaches, and um, the doctors, of course, say that, oh, she still have to wear a BiPAP, and she's been doing it, but lately she's been resisting it because she feels like there's no difference. She still feels energetic in the morning, and I'm having a hard time having her put it on at night now. So um, she does, but now she's resisting. But before she actually noticed the difference. Sure. So I guess my question is, um, should she still be on bypass? I, I think she should, but what do you, what, what do you think? I think she should get a sleep study. Yeah, yeah. 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 and that would be one way to, to really to give you the data that you need. Um, they can do a sleep study without her being on BiPAP, and if the oxygen level drops down or carbon dioxide level rises, they can put it back on it. They've done that before the surgery. Right, but and if, if things are different after, and certainly with you know spinal intervention, 
you know, her uh, you know, thorax, her spine, and her breathing to help with you a little better. And if it seems like that's the case, and you want to see if she needs BiPAC, then the only really uh, scientific way of doing that um, would be to do another sleep study. Yeah. But you can't really make any. Yeah, well, that's, that's, well, no, that would be your answer right there. If you don't eat it and you're hyperventilating, um, yeah, as I mentioned yesterday, you can, you know, if you make your CO2 too low, that's not nearly as bad as if it's too high, but it's not good either. Um, two questions related. One is, um, is the BiPAP sort of muscle sparing, so it's just sort of giving your muscles a break and sort of preventing future damage. And I don't know if that's one consideration. Well, it's sort of muscle supporting. Um, yeah, like if you know any of us were to have acute respiratory failure and have a breathing tube, you'd be doing all the work on your own. I'm sorry, the ventilator would be doing all the work. And if you're on a ventilator for, say, a month, then um, your muscles, your breathing muscles become deconditioned. And there's a sort of a slow weaning process to try and make the muscles do more work. BiPAP's a little different. It's just supposed to sort of take the edge off, so to speak, to make it a little easier to breathe, though you're still doing work. And so there's really not a concern about being on BiPAP and you know, sort of letting your muscles you know, wear away because you're using them during the day anyway. Yeah, yeah. I have just another question, and that's about um, um, MH. Um, is related hypothermia. Um, is it, I'm always just assuming that that is a risk, um, but I don't know. Is it known or is it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it known and there is no risk. So you can, there is no risk. We have done in vitro contracture tests in two patients. We said there were mutations and the response was normal. So that's something that we can get out of your mind. What, what is, what can be a risk? <laughs> That's the first time I've heard somebody say no definitively, and I suspect you're probably right. Um, I'm not a clinician, so I don't want to be in any kind of position of giving some really restrictive medical advice. I think other people would maybe be a little bit more cautious and say, it's probably you know, let your surgeons know that you have a neuromuscular <laughs> condition. But there's no biochemical evidence. You are the one person who's done this. We have to done it. That. You know, there's the reference uh, group in Belgium for in vitro contractor test, and they tested two patients with seven one mutations, and the response was normal. Uh, there are other considerations during anesthesia, general anesthesia. One is that most muscles that are abnormal will have some degree of abnormal calcium handling. So we'll have some degree of there is a chance that the response is not totally normal. But at least in these cases, there has been no clear contracture. So malignant hypertermia means that when you are put under general anesthesia using some very specific drugs, your muscles can become hypercontracted and produce a lot of heat, and this can be a very serious condition. Okay? So some cases, and in particular mutations of the y receptor are y R1 can lead to this condition. And because there are cores in, in seven or eight in my opinion, like in the other one, we thought this could be a, an issue. But I think this is not an issue. The issue is one, making sure how you are going to wake up from anesthesia. So I think that it's particularly important that any procedure, even a mild one, is performed in a place where they can support you if it takes some time to wake up and regain respiratory autonomy with anesthesia. But I think, you know, this can be kind of a very a heavy burden on the families because people, you know, some of them are denied surgery because surgeons, some surgeons are scared because of the respiratory situation plus the risk of malignant hypertension. I think we have now enough patients to at least, you know, take this burden out of them.
the series of 200 patients that we have put together, none of them have malignant hepatitis, and none of the family members. Okay. So I would agree with everything you said there. Um, and I would also just say that if your surgeon ever says they are against doing surgery because of increased risk, that you, even the patients with randomly receptor mutations with known risk, there are safe ways of doing surgery, and you avoid certain anesthetics, and you have certain safety measures. So if you're being told you can't have certain needed surgery because it's too risky, I would get a second opinion. Yeah. <laughs> There's actually a malignant hyperthermia call center. Um, I don't know what the exact name is, uh, but I know one of my colleagues at, at, at CHOP runs it. Um, and it's obviously primarily to serve the RY or one community, but it's available to anybody that, that has questions. Our hospital does have uh, naturally, they have the, you know, the, the, the antidote um, always available. And you know, so if he goes in for surgery, I say MHS, and they will have the kid ready. Um, the other thing that um, Sophie recently had wisdom teeth out, and they told us it was in the hospital under full sedation to bring the BiPAP for the PACU. So um, that's another thing, just bring the BiPAP and have it ready after. Coming out of the yes, I think that the other thing is that you can ask for information about um, what tends to happen in process that the drugs that trigger malignant hypothermia are drugs that have been unused for many years, but now there are safer alternatives. So, what sometimes happens is that the anesthetists just like to avoid these drugs in any patient with any kind of muscle disease because, well, there are safer options. So. So one other thing I would just bring up um, is definitely if your child's undergoing surgery, bring your BiPAP, and if you have a top assist, bring that. Or if you don't have one, then ask to have one used after surgery to help with lung recruitment. Um, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of you guys who are studying step in one for us. And uh, all the work that you have done. You are the leaders that we went to, and we very thankful. Um, I also wanted to encourage anybody who's not involved in our 7 one Facebook support group to join because we do share a lot of information, um, any studies that we find, and support for each other. So it's a great outlet. And if you haven't registered with your CMD and, and provided your genetic test, please do so because um, without the genetic test, the registration isn't as helpful. And the more numbers we have, the better. Introduce yourself. Oh. Well, most people know me. <laughs> My name is Kristen, and I uh, I sort of moderate or the moderator for the Seven One Facebook group. There are no other questions. I have one more. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so I, I, maybe I speak for most of the uh, parents and uh, non-parents in this group here, but we've recently heard of uh, some significant drug trials going on for limb girdle here in the United States. I believe it's for limb girdle. Two shans, maybe. But, um, you know, it's one of the several dystrophies that are out there. With that in mind, if they are successful, how hopeful can you doctors be and us as parents be that perhaps the results, if successful from those trials, can be used perhaps for more specific uh, diseases such as seven one. Is there any correlation or any hope that perhaps what's ex what's successful for Duchenne's might be perhaps a building block for success in a seven one treatment? Definitely. Uh, the problems that are made in treating the genetic treatment of one uh, genetic muscle disease will inform all the other trials in all the other genetic conditions. In that sense of uh, tools that have been developed for these trials and all the knowledge that the PCA generated for these trials will be very informative for any other genetic species. And I'll just add that two drugs were actually approved this year by the FDA, which is really exciting for two very rare neuromuscular conditions, one for spinal muscular atrophy, SMA, and another one for Duchenne. Uh, and the reason I'm bringing this up in this group is Parent advocacy groups really had a lot to do with getting those drugs approved. Uh, they really uh, they lobbied heavily with the FDA, with, with Congress, 
and really help drive the treatments forward. So parents, advocacy groups really can um, have a lot to do with, with therapies and clinical trials. So I'm glad you're all here. Yeah, that's what I emphasize what Anna said, and it's, it's absolutely true. Um, my lab has studied the group of congenital myopathies, not focusing exclusively on Zephan or myotubular or M1, because when we learn about one of these, it often tells us quite a bit about some of the others. Uh, and also, as Anna said, as technology is evolving, a success in one area can be applied to another. And some of you who were at the Zephan conference about a month ago, we had a representative, Don Blessing, from Odentist Therapeutics, which is a company developing gene therapy for myotubular myopathy. Um, it's similar, has some similar characteristics to CEPN in that it's recessive, so it's caused by the absence of something, and the missing protein and the gene that encodes it is small enough to fit <coughs> that gene therapy, and that company just received approval from the FDA to start clinical trials this summer for myotubular myopathy. And so they're already thinking about what would their next step be. And so it's premature to say that they're going to now start a program on ZFN. But we had them come partly so we could educate them about the needs of this community. As they have success in one area, then they'll look to expand and apply the technology and advances they've made into new areas. So all of it is very synergistic. Um, the exon skipping approaches that were developed for Duchenne were later applied to spinal muscular atrophy, the same type of, of molecular mechanism. And so all of this synergizes beautifully. Do you, can I just say something I want to make too, also for the audience, for the Do you think if, when you guys meet new people with several one that you could forward them on to our group so that we can try and get our group as large as possible? Because I know you said you treat 40, 40 to 50, and. In, in, in France, but can they not, can they just suggest you know there's there's a support group out there um, you know for you? We do, and actually some of my patients are streaming with you while yeah, I'm yeah. seeing them. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, no, we do. I think uh, one of the reasons why not all of them might be joining is that the, the proactivity that patients need to have here in America is not always present in European patients because the context is very different. Yeah. But we do. Yeah, we have, I think, several from France, but yes. not 40. I know you do, because it's on the computer, but it's you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't talk to you. Just a uh, question. Uh, within the past few years, I've uh, I don't know if anybody else has had this issue. Uh, as my condition has slowly progressed, uh, uh, I'm having some issues with, uh, I guess, uh, going to the restroom, number one. Uh, and uh, I'm just wondering if there's any uh, direct correlation with the condition. Uh, I find that when I uh, try to stand up to go to the restroom, then I use that, those muscles and I have the urgency. And, so I'm just wondering if there's any kind of correlation possible. Yes, weakness. this is very common. It's probably because the pelvic floor muscles are weak cause of this condition. So yes, urgency, incontinence can be actually quite of a problem for even for very young patients. So this is something that needs to be considered. It can be improved up to an extent with physical therapy directed to strengthening the pelvic floor muscles. So it can help you not to with the functional issues, but yes, this is definitely not uncommon in this condition, both in, in you know, in the males and in females. I just want to add on and ask you if you could, in addition to supporting the 7 on Facebook, um, encourage people to register in the Congenital Muscle Disease International Registry or the CMDIR because for step N1, we are pretty much the only um, game in town as a registry. Um, so please, the, it's a numbers game for a lot of these, and the more people we get registered, the more people who submit their genetic tests um, and remain active, the better we are as a community. I really like what you said, because it's gonna take the, um, the parents and the support groups to really help push that needle, not only with research, but also with funding. And I, I hate to bring up the money word, but I cannot stress it enough. Studies like Anna's will not go forward without financial support. So if you want to do a bake sale, do a bake sale. If you want to 
My husband walked 4,000 miles and donated money towards your CMD for every mile he walked. So it doesn't have to be a big 10K that takes monstrous amount of times to organize. Just do something small, but please, if you can, donate. And again, I, I know I yelled this out yesterday, and this is so not PC. Uh, many of you, have, it's, it's wonderful because they do amazing camps, but if you donate to Muscular Dystrophy Association in the US, it does not come to our organization. There are people that do benefit from the Muscular Dystrophy Association, and I would say it is appropriate to donate money there if your intent is that money is not going to research. We are getting benefits from MDA. If your intent is you want your money to go to research, then of course, cure CMD. So, not to disagree with you over there, Robin, but support both pending what your intent for your donation is. So is there anyone else in the audience who has not had a chance to talk about something with their care that they think is really important? And if not, then we'd like to get a picture of, of everyone up in the front here. Is there anyone else who hasn't had a chance to talk about something in their care that went wrong or the doctor should have done better? We've been told off and on that with BiPAP, it's okay to have a night off. So like my, you know, like my nine-year-old, if he goes for a sleepover, is it okay to have that night off with the sleepover? Or should he always 100% bring it with? And he does, I mean, he, it rarely happens, but I've and heard concerns. living your life. I, I can't imagine being a huge issue unless you know that, boy, if he doesn't wear it, he's in absolute fear of the next day. Um, then maybe you want to have a but we're not, But we're not taking a major life risk if no. once every three months or six no. months or whatever he no, goes I about. mean, okay. certainly no more risk than what would happen is if, if he were to get sick. Okay. So it's just, I, I, I don't consider it a huge issue, Okay. obviously. Virus said, say use it every night, but and, and like do, I said, he does. You need but. to do what's practical. Okay. There was a story that um, what went out from a family of four that um, all have seven one two children have passed. Yeah. One, the parents, and I'm not breaking hip up because the parents did broadcast this on uh, a, a new station, a new station or something, but. Um, their reasoning behind one of the child's passing was because she took the BiPAP mask off at night. They were probably more severe on the spectrum, if, per se, yep. but I, I just did want to mention that. Well, I would think that in that situation, you know, the mask slipping off at night would, what, what, what I'm saying is that you'd probably have some sign that not having the mask on would be bad. Right. And, you know, I'm sure that you all have woken up, you know, or your children have woken up and either taken the mask off or it's gotten dislodged and it's not working effectively. And, you know, I think obviously if your child is perfectly fine with that and is yelling and screaming because it's uncomfortable, right. then you're probably okay. I think they were more severe, but yeah. I just wanted to sure. mention that. Sure, sure. No, I appreciate that. So if you think it's a good time to wrap up and get some lunch. Uh, for those of you who have questions about what happens during adulthood, what happens when you get 50, how your life is going to be, we're having another session about CMD in adulthood, all types together. And thank you very much for your discussion.